All right, welcome to this next webinar on the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit. I mean, excuse me, not the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit. Uh, that's the summit that's coming up in June 2021. So you can find out more information on that by going to mfinsummit.com. We're actually talking about the webinar for today, the Multifamily Investor Nation Weekly Webinar Series. And today's topic is going to be about what to consider when you're structuring an apartment syndication. So we're going to be talking about equity waterfalls and hurdles and we're going to talk about the entities maybe that you should use to set them up. We're talking about different types of equity splits as well as preferred returns. And then we're also going to be talking about the IRR and how the IRR is different from the ROI and why and how is it different, right? So that you can have a better understanding as to do those different terms. So first thing I want to mention is, is I'm Dan Hanford. I'm one of the managing partners of a group called PassiveInvesting.com. So if you want to find out more information about our group, you can do that now. You can go to PassiveInvesting.com. I'm not going to go into too much detail about my background, but on the website there, there is a section there um, under team that will give you a little bit more about my background. I'm actually located here in Columbia, South Carolina. I live here with my wife and our four children. We have four children, 10 eight, getting ready to be nine, actually. We have a, a, our, our, my second child, a Caleb. His uh, birthday is always on tax day, April 15th. So obviously this year, tax day got pushed a little bit, but uh, he's, he's April 15th. So he'll be nine years old. We'll, we'll have a 10, a nine, a four, and a three-year-old that are in our house. So definitely a busy household, busy lifestyle. And uh, so we wanted to provide a lot of this information for you virtually because it keeps me from having to travel all the time, right? And do a lot of these events. And so it allows us to be able to stay uh, close to our family as well. So today, let's go ahead and dive into the material. We already mentioned a little bit about the summit coming up in June, the MFINsummit.com. You can go there, find out more information and register for that event and uh, look forward to having you at that event. But today, let's go ahead and dive into the material, dive into the topic at hand, which is what to consider when you structure an apartment syndication. So the first question that we're going to cover today is what type of entity should you choose when you're setting up a syndication? right? So there's multiple types of, 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 of entities that you could choose from. You could do an S corp, you could do a C corp, you could do an LLC, you could do, you could do an LP. There's probably a bunch of other different ones that you could do. You could just do a straight partnership if you wanted to, right? Um, so there's a lot of different um, structures that you could do. But I'm going to tell you about what we do at PassiveInvesting.com, which will give you some, some insights into how maybe you want to do it as well. So we always set it up with an LLC. And the LLC is usually going to be set up in the state in which the property is located, or depending on lender requirements, the lender might require you to register your LLC in a state like Wyoming or Delaware. Most commonly, we see is Delaware um, when it comes to the to, to the when it comes to the to the lenders. It's a little bit more favorable from a from a, from a, 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 a corporate law, if you will, and protecting the lender. So a lot of times, the lenders, depending on the sizes of the loan, a lot of times with when ours. Once it gets over about 30, 35 million in purchase price, that's when the lenders require you or want you to be able to register in, 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 the, in Delaware, in the state of Delaware, okay? So, but an LLC is, is this typical structure you're going to have. And you're going to probably have multiple LLCs, right? So you can have multiple time, multiple LLCs that are set up so that you can uh, 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 put together your syndication. So you'll have the the main entity that's buying the buying the deal, and you might actually have the, the an LP over here. I mean, an LLC over here and an LLC over here that's actually buying into that particular LLC, and that's kind of how that structure would be set up. So there's there's the operator side, the GP side, and then there's also going to be the LP or the limited partner or the investor side, right? And so there might be two different LLCs that are set up for those as well, just from an extra level of protection from a from a, a corporate veil perspective, if you will. So that's the entity. Those are the types of entities you're going to be able to you, you would likely use. I have seen other ones being used, but those are the most common ones are going to be your LLC structure. The next question here is, is, what are the different types of equity splits and preferred returns to, to consider? Now, my wife and I are invested in about 38 different investments, LP investments across the country with about 14, 15 different operators. And we put together a list of these kind of seven red flags to consider when placing your own money into somebody else's projects, right? And so for those of you who are a passive investors, it'd be great for you to review that so you have a better understanding as to some things to watch out for. Um, and they truly are red flags. So they're not yellow. They don't just go, mm, maybe we won't do it. It's if it's the it's one of these are present or not present, then it's truly a red flag that we don't move forward with it. 
right? And so uh, we all, and, and, and Melissa can actually find this article for you on our PassiveInvesting.com website. There you go. She was actually one step ahead of me. And she, uh, she has that article there. For those of you who are joining us live, if for some reason you're not joining us live and this is the recording, you can go to our website, PassiveInvesting.com. And there's a Knowledge Center at the top. You can click on Knowledge Center and just type in the search box, or box, box, red flags, and that article will come up so you can dive in a little bit deeper on that. But even for, for those of you who are looking to, to put together your own projects actively, this is a good list for you to go through to build a structure, your own syndications, to make sure that you are protecting your investors as much as possible. So this is something that, well, I would highly recommend that you use, whether you're an active or a passive investor. And the reason why I bring it up is because we're going to be talking about these preferred returns. And I will not invest in a deal unless it has preferred returns. And so if you want to um, learn more about some of those other red flags, you can go to that article and check it out. However, as far as the, the preferred returns are concerned, usually we're going to see anywhere between about a 7 to 9% preferred return, right? So it's more, if it's going to be more of a preferred equity position, so you have a better position in the capital stack, so it's a lower risk position, you're going to usually have a little bit higher preferred return, but maybe no participation in the upside. And then if you are um, on a, uh, if you are in a, in a syndication, or if you are, uh, excuse me, if you're in a, a little bit, a, like a class B structure. And we're going to go through some of these different structures here in just a moment when we answer the next question. But when we go through some of these, you will see that the preferred returns will go down if there's participation on the upside. So like a, if it's a dual tier structure, you might see in the class A, which is a, a lower risk option, 9% preferred return with no upside. And then in the class B position, you might actually see a 7% preferred return or maybe even an 8% preferred return, but then there's participation on the upside over and above that. So those are the kind of uh, preferred returns that you would want to consider when you're structuring and putting together your, your, your deals for yourself. Now, as far as the equity splits are concerned, our group does 70-30 splits, right? So I know some groups do 60-40. I know some that do 80-20. We feel it's a great kind of sweet spot to be in that 70-30, 70% for the LPs or the investors, and then 30% for us as the GP and the operator for our sweat equity. We've considered going down from that and maybe doing like a 75-25 and an 80-20. And we feel like the more we have to give up, it creates a lot difference in a, in a misalignment of interest between the GP and the LP. And so we feel like that 70-30 split is a nice sweet spot, which is what the majority of people will actually do is that 70-30 split. So will we consider lower in the future? It's possible, but it just depends on kind of where the market is and where it's actually going, right? But with right now, right now we, we've been able to find deals that pencil very well with a 70-30 split. And if you want to kind of see how we structure some things and you're interested in investing with us, you can go to our website, PassiveInvesting.com. There's two offerings available up there right now for you. We have our deal out of Orlando, uh, Florida that we're actually closing in about two weeks. It's called Monteroso. You can go to our website, PassiveInvesting.com. And if it's still available for investment, you can see that under the current offerings. You'll see that listed there and you can you can register to look at the investor offering memorandum on it as well. And then the, the other other offering that we have available is our real estate debt fund. So you can go to our, our website there and check out the real estate debt fund and find out more information about what that's all about. Basically providing a 6% preferred return to investors um, on some that's actually backed by real hard assets, but it has a liquidity option to it. So it allows investors to be able to get their capital out, which in a multifamily investment, you're not usually able to get it out until you sell the asset. So you're locking it up for usually three to five to seven years. Whereas in the real estate debt fund, if you have some, you know, uh, reserve capital somewhere that's sitting around earning nothing in a savings or a money market, you can actually open up a investment account with us with their real estate debt fund. And we place that money into the different rehab loans for fix and flippers locally and primarily the Carolinas, but also some in Georgia. And right now there's about uh, 12, $13 million in that fund. And you're immediately your, your funds are immediately diversified across all the loans in that portfolio. And right now we're only doing first position liens. So you can find out more information there about that offering available too. So the, as far as the equity splits, usually 70-30. You could do a little bit, a little bit you know, higher or lower than that, but the sweet spot, what you'll see in most offerings is that 70-30 split. And of course, preferred returns are usually anywhere between about 7 to 9%. Now, one of the other things about the preferred return that you want to be aware of is what is called a, a cumulative preferred return or a non-cumulative preferred return. The preferred return is, I mean, the, or the cumulative preferred return 
is if for some reason in, in a certain year during the hold period, let's say I only hit, say, a, a, a 5% preferred return, and I originally was going to give you 7% preferred return. Well, in a cumulative preferred return setting, that now the next year, because I didn't hit the 7% in the, in the current year, the next year would actually be 9%, right? So we're going to take those two percentage points that I missed, and I would add it to the next year. So the next year is 9% right? Until you are actually made, until the investors are actually made whole. That's what I suggest. That's what I would recommend for you as well. But there are some people who do what's called a non-cumulative preferred return, which is if I don't hit the preferred return one year, too bad, so sad, you don't get it. You just lose it, right? And so the next year, every year, it just resets to the preferred return amount. So you want to make sure that as a passive investor, you're watching out for that, but also as an active investor, you're setting it up for your investors to see success when it comes to these offerings that you're putting together. Now, uh, the next level here, the next line here is about how do waterfalls and, and hurdles impact the overall returns for LPs and GPs, right? So, in the, in the first, we have to understand what a waterfall is, and we have to also understand what a hurdle is. So, inside of the waterfall are various hurdles, right? And so, I'll give you a, a quick example as to some of the deals that we put together. We typically have two hurdles within our waterfall. The first hurdle is what is called the preferred return hurdle. So, and when you think of a waterfall structure, think of it like a bunch of buckets, right? Think of like you have a, a bucket here, then you have a bucket here, and you have a bucket here, and you have a bucket here, right? These are all the different hurdles you want to get to each one of the buckets, right? And so, when you're looking at the cash flows or you're looking at the proceeds upon sale, the money or the cash that's coming in is going to flow into the top bucket first and it's going to fill up that bucket and then the waterfall is going to, or the cash is going to roll over into the next bucket, right? And that's going to be that next hurdle, right? And it's going to fall into that next bucket and it's going to fill up that bucket. And once it fills up that bucket, the bucket, that'll be another hurdle and it'll fall over into the next bucket. So that's kind of how you want to think about and, 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 and uh, structure uh, when you're thinking about a waterfall and these different hurdles. So in ours, we have two waterfalls. I mean, we have one waterfall, excuse me, um, and we have the actual, uh, uh, the actual, not the waterfall, but the, the hurdles in the waterfall. So the first hurdle is going to be the preferred return hurdle. So we, investors are going to get 100% of the cash flows. So I can think about those buckets. We're going to get 100% of the cash flows, right, up until they get to that 7% preferred return. And then the cash is going to roll over or spill over into the next bucket, which is going to be a 70-30 split for the investor is getting 70 70% of the, of the profits and then the GPs are getting 30%, right? And this is going to be what we call our cash flow waterfall because typically there are two waterfalls in each deal. There's a cash flow waterfall and then there's going to be a a, a a promote waterfall and I'll discuss that one in just a moment. This one is going to be a cash flow waterfall. And so you have that first 7%, 100% of the proceeds going into the investors up to that preferred return. And that's going to spill over into the investor, into the, the equity split, right? So then 70% of the profits are going to the LPs, 30% are going to the GPs until that bucket gets filled up. So in ours, we actually have two water, two hurdles in the waterfall. We have the 7% preferred return waterfall hurdle, and we have the waterfall hurdle down here, which is actually usually 13% IRR. So once we hit a 13% IRR, what's going to happen is, is it going to fall over into the next bucket, and then that bucket's going to be a 50-50 split. And usually that bucket never gets filled up, right? Because there's not another waterfall hurdle after that. So that's going to be that last hurdle in the waterfall. So that bucket is kind of as big as the cash flows that are, or that are available to distribute, right? So those, that's kind of a simple cash flow waterfall fall where the proceeds and the cash flows, class flows that you receive off the investment month after month are distributed based on that waterfall. Make sense? All right. So the next one would be what is called a sale or a refinance or what we call a promote waterfall. It's very similar to the cash flow waterfall, except that there is a another bucket in between the first one, which is the preferred return hurdle and the equity split hurdle. So on a sale or a what we call a, a refinance or a supplemental loan or some sort of capital event, the, the, the operator does not get any of the profits from that until all of the initial capital is returned back to the investors. At least that's how we set it up. That's how I prefer to see waterfalls when my wife and I place investments with other operators. So we're gonna first get that 7% you know, preferred return bucket filled up. 
is going to fill all the way up. That hurdle is going to fall over into the the equity or the the capital return hurdle or, or or yeah hurdle or bucket. And so once all the capital has been returned, then it falls over into that 70-30 split, and then it will roll over into the next hurdle, which would be that 50-50 split after that performance based hurdle of 13%. So that's kind of the structure we have when it comes to the cash flow waterfall hurdle and the uh, the actual sale or the promote waterfall hurdle. Okay. All right, so let's go, let's go into this last question here, which is how is the IRR different from the ROI? And then I'll open it up for some questions here and we'll have about five or 10 minutes or so for some questions. All right, um, this last question is about the IRR and the ROI. So let me give you a quick example. So the ROI, the return on investment is definitely different from the IRR, which is the internal rate of return. And you can actually find out if you really want to dive in deep on the IRR on our passiveinvesting.com website in that knowledge center, you can type in IRR in the search box. And I actually wrote an article detailing this as well as the formulas and the, and the, and the, the calculations and things like that um, on the website there. So you can actually see that if you really want to nerd out on it. Um, and so uh, the, IR, the, IR, the ROI typically is, is uh, a kind of a flawed formula, right? And so let me give you a quick example. So for those of you who are watching live, I want you to participate with me here. So if, if uh, so in the chat box, if I was to give you a $100,000 or you were to give me $100,000 and I, I was able to give you back $300,000, is that a good investment? So you, you, you gave me 100,000 and then I gave you 300,000 back. Is that a good investment? So go ahead and type in the chat box in there. Just let me know. Don't worry about it. Just think about it. Just say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into it a little bit further because a lot of it is, uh, as you think about that, you go, oh, it's $100,000. Great, but now I'm getting 300,000 back. That's a phenomenal investment, right? So is that yes or no, a good investment? Or bad investment. So a lot of you on here are, are, are asking the right questions, right? It really depends. It depends on the time. And so, yes, if I was to do that, like Tom mentioned in his, his comment, in one month, yeah, that's a phenomenal return. But what I failed to tell you is that it took 30 years to do that. So in 30 years of me holding on to your money, I was able to give you back $300,000 out of your 100000 that you gave me. Now you're looking at that and go, no, that's a terrible investment, right? And that's the flaw with the ROI. It does not bake into it, the, the, into an account, the time value, right? The time value of the, of the return. So we, we actually use what is called an IRR, the internal rate of return. And the internal rate of return bakes into it the time component of how long we are holding on to somebody's money. And so the IRR is actually a negative number up until the point where we return all the capital back to the investors. And once all that capital is returned back to the investors, then it starts to become a positive IRR. But the longer you hold on to somebody's money, the lower the IRR. So, but, and so, you know, opposite of that, right, contrasting that, the, the faster you return back money to investors, the higher the IRR is. And so it's very important to understand that when you're placing capital as a passive investor, but it's also important for you as an active investor when you're putting together deals to think about that when you're trying to put together, put it together and structure things, right? And so this would be a good, uh, under, for you, good, a good basic knowledge for you to understand the differences between that IRR and the ROI. All right, so we got through all of our questions for the webinar today. So I want to open it up for those of you who are live with us. If you have any questions for me about these topics, I would love to be able to dive deep into some of these if you'd like and uh, spend about another five or 10 minutes with you and answering some of these questions. Otherwise, we can wrap it up and we'll, we'll talk about the topic for next week. And while you guys are typing in some of your questions, I'm going to see if I can refresh my screen and see what the topic is going to be for next week. There we go. All right, so next week, we are going to be uh, talking about uh, Property Management 101. So we're going to be talking about Property Management 101 for apartment syndication. Your host is going to be on here with Brandon Abbott. So he's one of our other managing partners with our group, PassiveInvesting.com. And he's going to bring on one of our property management companies, uh, managing directors. So his name is Bob Moore. He's going to be with you, sharing that with you. Um, and so if, uh, if you want to go to our website, multifamilyinvestornation.com uh, forward slash MFIN webinar, you can go there and register for the next webinar that's coming up next week. It'll be next Tuesday at 11 a.m. So it's going to be April 20th. So you can register for the next webinar coming up. 
All right. So I have a couple of questions that have, that have came in here. So Craig is asking, can you explain more how you calculate the IRR? And the answer to that question is no. And the reason why is because it's a pretty complicated formula that is usually only done in Excel because it's hard to do by hand. But if you want to dive a little bit deeper on that calculation, you can go to our website, PassiveInvesting.com, and in the Knowledge Center, type in IRR. And there's an article that I wrote last year that broke down the actual formulas and the calculations to be able to do that. So you can certainly do that. And, uh, and, and most people are just using an Excel spreadsheet or some sort of a, a computer program to actually do those calculations. All right, Justin's asking, what is generally considered to be a good IRR when putting together a syndicated and offering and, uh, and syndicating an offering to investors? So uh, this is really going to be dependent upon your investors, right? Because you're going to be cultivating a list of investors that you are priming to let them know what kind of returns you're putting together. So I've seen some investors that are different than ours, but I'll share with you what we do. So we do two types of two different types of investments. We do a class A investment and a class B investment. Um, and what I mean by that is not shares. I'm talking about the actual asset class. So we do an A class asset. We call our suburban class A's. And then we do a, a B plus with value add. On the B plus with value add, you're going to be a little bit higher return. So because there's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more risk than the lower return ones, which are usually your lower risk investments. So the class B plus with value adds are usually going to be between about kind of 13, 14%, upwards to about 15, 16% on the re, on the IRR perspective, right? Um, and then on the, the, like the suburban class A's that we put together, they're going to be a little bit lower than that because they're going to be a little bit lower risk investment, not as much CapEx or heavy value add or anything like that. And so those ones are going to usually be about that, that kind of you know, 11, 12, 13%, somewhere around there. Um, obviously, in a, in a best case scenario, they can go a little bit higher than that. But you know, to be realistic, when we talk to our investors, we try to be not too overly optimistic. We want to be as realistic as possible because for us and our investors, we would rather project a 11 or 12 or 13% return for investors on a kind of suburban class A and then outperform that asset and get a 14, 15, 16% then really trying to project a 14, 15, 16% and then only getting 11, 12 or 13, right? So we'd rather project on the more conservative end and for our investors and then be able to outperform for them. But great questions, uh, great question in regards to the returns there. All right. AAR, which is the average annual return versus the IRR, the internal rate of return, please describe that, that what is the typical spread and what AAR do you target? So we typically are more IRR driven than AAR driven. So we don't usually go after assets based on the ARR. AAR, we are really focused on that, on that IRR because the IRR gives us a better picture to be able to normalize it between uh, different investments, right? So when we look at the IRR, it gives us a better way to be able to get out a lot of the different variables and really focus on it. Even in, even in the corporate world, in corporate America, whenever they, they're looking to add a particular invest, on investment, add a particular building onto the property or adding a particular division, they use that IRR calculator to be able to, give, to, be able to normalize some of the data to be able to compare you know, what kind of return we're going to get if we do you know, project A or project B or project C. So we don't usually look at the AAR as much, even though we do calculate it and provide it to our investors to be able to look at. Let's see, uh, will the recording be sent out? Yes, we will be resending the recording out to this. And let's see. Uh, in my underwriting model, when I calculate IRR, I include appreciation. Question is, do you include market appreciation in addition to value add or forked appreciation? So the answer to that question is, Maybe, right? So uh, the, the forced appreciation is obviously going to be added in, right? So as you do your value add play, your numbers and your underwriting model should be improving as far as the net operating income. And that's going to show in your, your IRR calculation. Now, any appreciation outside of that is going to be a little bit harder, right? Because then you're kind of guessing as to what those exit cap rate scenarios are going to look like. And so what we do for our investors is we share kind of a range of where we feel the investment could be, right, when we exit. So if we enter at, say, like a 5% cap rate, we're going to show a spread between about 4.5% 
to 5.5% spread in the cap rate so the investors know what's the range of where we feel like this could conservatively fall, right? So if it really starts to compress in that market, going down to 4.5, what would those returns look like? And then what would happen if, the, if, the, if that, that market started to soften a little bit? And what would those returns look like? So we do we do kind of norm, give, give some data for the investors to have a range of what it would look like. So we're not just trying to sell kind of pie in the sky numbers to our investors. We want to be as realistic as possible. All right. Well, that's all the questions that I have. That looks like they're coming in right now. So I want to first thank each one of you for being here. If you have not registered for the summit coming up in June, make sure you do that. It's going to be a great event. Uh, it's going to be mfinsummit.com. Just go to mfinsummit.com and register for it. And we'll look forward to seeing you back there in June. Next week, don't forget, we have our, our next webinar coming up, Property Management 101 for Apartment Syndication with Bob Moore with FCA Management, one of the managing directors there, as well as one of our own managing partners with PassiveInvesting.com, Brandon Abbott. So make sure you go and register for that. And if for some reason you don't want to attend that one, but you want to just get on our email list and join us on some of our future weekly webinars that we send out announcements to, you can just go to multifamilyinvestornation.com and register. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar that we're going to have next week. Each and every week, we're providing these webinars to you. So hopefully you're finding some value to them and look forward to sharing with you next week. So hope you have a good rest of your week and uh, have, a, have a great day. 